There's a plant here. Now this is a growth chamber. Humidity is even. The soil is identical with the two pots of plants. The, um, everything is equal. Because in science, you want to make sure you eliminate the variables so that you can test one single variable and see what the effect is. And so the one variable is that the, the, the light is not in the center. It's over here. So as this plant grows and gets bigger, it shades this plant. And eventually this plant gets really big and this plant dies. Okay? And guess what? If you do that experiment again, the same thing happens. And what does that mean in science? It's the truth. <laughs> if it's repeatable, it must be true. So that's what we, and this is the basis of the argument, believe it or not, that we're taught in college that all of us are fighting for scarce resources and only the strong survive and the weak don't. I mean, what's Darwin supposed to have said? Survival of the fittest. Now, you've got, this is not corn anymore, this is a tree. So these students finally wanted to prove that carbon dioxide actually went from here out into the soil. And so they put a bag over one of these branches and squirted in radioactive carbon dioxide gas. So the tree took it up, made it into radioactive sugar. And they had got out their Geiger counter. And they started following it. Beep, 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 down the branch. Bop, 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 down the trunk. Boop, 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 out the root. Beep, 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 out here into the soil. All right, we've got our doctorate. <laughs> we finished our paper. Everybody's celebrating. But someone set down the Geiger counter. Beep, 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 boop, 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 pop, 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 pop. All of a sudden, they found the plant next to it was taking up the radioactive sugar because the roots of this plant and the roots of that plant, if this is a root hair, very, this is super microscopic, right? These are cells of the very tip of the root hair. At the very end of these roots, when you have the root hairs, fungus will grow down into the root and punch a hole into the root and grow into the space between the cells, or some funguses will actually punch a hole into the cell and put a bunch of little fungal hairs in there. And this is where the sugar goes. This is one place the sugar goes. It pumps out of the root into this fungus. Fungus is called a mycorrhizal fungus. Myco means fungus, rhiza means root, it's a root fungus. So it turns out that these funguses are all through the soil and the sugar that is pumped into mycorrhizal fungi here gets pumped up into this poor plant that's in the shade because the fungus decides that it's getting something in trade from this plant that it likes. And so it trades the sugar that it got from the bigger plant for whatever it's little chemical it's getting from this plant. So you can go to the black forest in Germany and you'll see wild strawberries growing under pine trees where no direct sunlight ever falls. And scientists have walked by that forever and never, they, they must have been thinking something like it's shade tolerant. But they were taught in school that it's not possible. You know, and somehow they just disassociated from that experiment they learned in school and never asked the question, never were curious about how the hell do you get a sweet strawberry when there's no sunlight striking the plant? The answer is you can't call this a single species. You can't call this a single species. It's, it's, it's like, it's very, what we say, human-centered or anthrop anthropomorphic. We're making, we're making out like these are all separate things competing for resources. This is not survival of the fittest. This is community. So you, and this tree cannot survive without these fungi. It needs the fungus to break down rocks and soil and everything else and pump it in and it trades sugar for it. And the tree is laughing all the way to the back. Oh, God, I can make so much sugar. And the fungus is saying, God, I can dissolve rocks all day. This is, I get all the sweet stuff. And it's, it's trade. Now, survival of the fittest. You know who actually said that? It wasn't Charles Darwin. 
Charles Darwin never said survival of the fittest. Charles Darwin said, if two organisms compete, nature extincts them both because they're not putting their energy into reproduction. So make love, not war. It's very important in nature. Okay. Who said survival of the fittest? Herbert Spencer. Herbert Spencer, a right-wing a right wing economist creating a theory called social Darwinism in which all of us are competing for scarce resources and the poor should die and the rich should ascend. So this social Darwinism is where that phrase comes from and Darwin never said it. Okay, this is important because here you've got seven pounds of carbon dioxide apparently just in the roots, the stalk, and the grain, but in reality 80% of the sugar that the corn stalk makes, the corn plant makes, is exuded into the soil. So it's not seven pounds, it's more like about 12 pounds. I'm just doing rough math here. Carbon dioxide is taken out for every pound of grain that made a half a pound of alcohol. So when we go ahead and talk about increasing photosynthesis and growing crops for making alcohol, we are talking about reversing global warming. We'll be taking out carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and sticking it down, trapping it in living things in the soil. Question? Is this a trickle-down ecosystem then? <laughs> <laughs> yes, if it's a trickle-down ecosystem theory. I won't even comment on that because I, I can't do that in polite language. Um, My question though is, uh, does hemp work better? I you know, that, that I, I wondered how that didn't get up here because hemp always gets asked about it. Um, I'll touch on that just really briefly because it, it just so happens that a cooperative of hemp growers in Canada are asking me to do something about this. Basically, industrial hemp, you know, the, the um, original flag of the United States was a hemp flag. George Washington's big crop was hemp for, you know, for fiber, for fabric. Um, hemp has been an industrial product plant for a long time and in fact when you grow the industrial varieties which are not you know very potent as a drug they get 14 feet tall you know in a very short period of time that's a lot of biomass that's a lot of cellulose um, it's pretty good though there are things that are better you can get five to eight tons of cellulose per acre from hemp now, most of that's too valuable to turn into alcohol because you can turn it into fabric, but there's what call, are called the hemp herds, which are all the non-fiber cellulosic material in hemp, and that can be made into alcohol, and that's what these hemp growers in Canada want to do, so we're working on that with them. I'll talk more, more of the cellulose in a little bit. Um, okay, so what we did with this whole description is we talked about how alcohol pulls more carbon dioxide out of the air than it uses in production and actually reverses global warming. Um, and even corn makes sense in terms of a crop for re re reversing global warming. But there are other crops that are better. Um, I'll just touch on a few of them, although I cover about 40 different crops in the book. But I'm going to give you a couple of interesting ideas to think about. Is the algae pertinent to this conversation? Yes, algae's coming. Oh, okay. I happen to have a, a very large section of the book on algae because you'll see why. Um, Um, what's the largest irrigated crop in the United States? Soy. We have corn, soy. Someone said soy. Cotton. Wheat. Wheat. Grass clippings. <laughs> grass clippings. We produce three times as many grass clippings by dry weight as we do irrigated corn. There's over 30 million, um, 30 million acres, as, as far as NASA is able to figure out, of lawn in the United States. It uses more fertilizer than the entire country of India, just fertilizing our lawns. Okay. So, you know, when it gets, we'll talk, I guess we're, we're starting to, I'm going to get back to it because cellulose is kind of a, a separate case, but you know, basically grass is a cellulose product. But I want you to start thinking that there are things around you going to waste that can be made into alcohol. But we'll talk about